Welcome to our first uh, installment of our presidential speaker series for the fall of 2015 at LaSalle College. My name is Megan McCarney. I'm the special projects coordinator here at LaSalle and I'm in charge of organizing these events. The presidential speaker series are public forums that invite scholars and professionals to present lectures on topics of interest and importance to the LaSalle College community. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jay Bradner. Dr. Bradner is an oncologist from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where he directs the Bradner Laboratory, and he's also an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. In addition to his own research on gene expression in cancer cells, Dr. Bradner has been a champion of the open source research movement, which focuses on sharing discoveries with other researchers in order to expedite the discovery process and create a more collaborative approach to curing the world's most troubling diseases. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bradner. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation, um, President Alexander and uh, Megan. Um, uh, I will say of, um, uh, from Chicago, which this week with our Cubs is proving to be a real um, sad, sad episode, um, but feel very much now a member of this Boston community. Um, and working at Dana-Farber, I'd like to just, before I could forget, um, thank all of you uh, for uh, supporting this institution and its cause and the uh, care of, I'm sure, many friends and colleagues and um, and, and loved ones over the years. Um, it's extraordinary now to live in this community, um, now with my young family just up the road, um, and see the way that this town rallies around um, you know, one of the greatest challenges in our lifetimes, which is the definitive uh, cure of this disease. Um, uh, as you heard, um, I train as a cancer doctor. I'm a stem cell transplant doctor by training. Um, these are a treatment for advanced blood cancers. Uh, but I retrained along the way in chemistry, which is the science of making molecules. And I've put one uh, molecule up here. You can see it perhaps um, shown here. These, um, uh, um, these are drug molecules, uh, molecules that would be in an aspirin tablet or a Tylenol or a medicine you get from the pharmacy. Too small to see, but on the atomic level, these are like keys that can fit in a keyhole. And so I suppose you could say I'm now a molecular locksmith making <laughs> molecules for cancer patients. Um, uh, I will say that uh, my laboratory at Dana-Farber has chemistry making molecules and biology uh, testing molecules and computer science to understand the effects these molecules have on cancer cells. Uh, what we're not is a drug company. We're not able to take these molecules and bring them to our patients. And so I'll talk about a couple of technologies today that just by way of disclosure have now left my laboratory into a biotech companies and then they come back for us to study at Dana-Farber as, as cancer medicines. Um, I graduated medical school in 1999 and this was the year a drug called Gleevec was approved. Have any of you heard of this drug Gleevec? Yeah. It's an extraordinary medicine. As a stem cell transplant doctor, when I started in practice, half the ward was full of patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. These are uh, patients um, often in their um, sixth and seventh um, uh, decade of life um, who um, had no options but to have their bone marrow replaced with a massive dose of chemotherapy and radiation. It's a truly medieval procedure, but it is cur curative of this disease. Um, Today, because of this medicine, imatinib, um, uh, it's very rare for us to transplant patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. They're at home, they're at work, they're with their children and grandchildren taking this medicine once a day. This medicine is targeted, it is precise. It's a molecule that targets the gene that causes leukemia, targeted therapy. This medicine has so revolutionized cancer, in it, but in two important ways, it changed our expectations. The first is the expectation that we have of what is possible in science to make targeted medicines, not the chemotherapies of old that make your hair fall out and bend you over the toilet for the evening, um, targeted medicines. The second is it changed the expectations of society on what science could deliver, what science ought to deliver, 
um, in the um, uh, desperate search for cancer cures. And as I was learn uh, training as a cancer doctor, it became clear to me that we have um, a drug problem. Um, our problem is we lack effective drugs. And this is not us against the pharmaceutical industry. I would do anything to help drug companies make drugs more effective for patients. Um, the challenge, as it turns out, is in the disease. Cancer is a genetic disease. It doesn't mean that you can inherit it, although you can. Um, it means that it's a disease caused when genes in your body are mutated, are changed, um, are damaged, or go awry. Uh, a cell in your body has about 24,000 genes, and mutations to two or three of them can cause a cancer. And over a lifetime, cancer increases in incidence because over a lifetime, you make a lot of new cells if things are going really well for you. Well, we can do something today at Dana-Farber that we weren't able to do 10 years ago. We can sequence the genome of the cancer cell and compare it to your normal genome. And this is for the very first time in our life in science allowed us to answer a very fundamental question. Doctor, why do I have cancer? And we can say, well, in you, it's because you've lost a, the vital break that prevents cells from dividing. And in you, it's because you've activated the vital accelerator pedal that causes cells to divide. These are called oncogenes and tumor suppressors. And so, like with Gleevec, you might say, well, then let's make a drug for all of the genes that can cause cancer. So I'll tell you today, there are 500 genes that can cause cancer, and we have 15 drugs, 15 types of targeted therapies. So this puts into perspective the scope of the challenge, but the scope of the opportunity that we have today in modern science to close the gap, to one by one, take down these genes drug by drug by drug, to deliver on the promise of targeted cancer therapy. So even though there might be 500 mutated genes in cancer, if you look at the cards that most cancers are holding, there's actually a small number of genes that cause the majority of human cancers. And this gene, MYC, and this gene, P53, they're the most commonly activated accelerator pedal, and they're the most commonly inactivated break, respectively. But we have no drug for MYC, and we have no drug for P53. And you might fairly say if you had a lymphoma driven by MYC, or you had ovarian cancer driven by a loss of P53, you'd say, well, I'll take the MYC drug if that's what's wrong with my cancer. And we'd say, well, we have no MYC drug. They say, well, doctor, is it new? Is this new information? Are you just getting started on making a MYC drug? No, we discovered MYC in 1984. They say, well, what is wrong with you? Why has your field not produced a MYC drug? And the very unsatisfying answer is MYC is too hard. It is undruggable. It is a gene that makes a protein that we have just not been successful at engaging with a key. Uh, we have not engineered a drug for this gene. Um, this target is too hard. And actually, many drug companies worked very hard in the 80s to do this, and they stopped. Um, could you imagine if computer manufacturers stopped to get telephones onto the internet? Um, uh, that, that field didn't stop, but, but my field, drug discovery, for a couple of these really hard targets, by and large, stopped. These targets were just allocated uh, relegated to a, a sector of science that was deemed too hard. Um, and so I started a lab at Dana-Farber in 2008, the most unlikely of places to discover drugs because there was very little chemistry in the rich history of Dana-Farber, important chemistry, but very little of it, with the idea that we would work for many years to make a MYC drug. So there's MYC. It's this little noodle, this little red noodle in the middle that sits on DNA and flips the switches of all the genes involved in cell growth. All it is is the conductor of the growth symphony. And in your body, after a big Mexican meal, MYC gets turned on to make a little more colon for you. Um, after an automobile accident, MYC gets turned on in your bone marrow to make some more red blood cells if you've lost your, some blood in that accident. In cancer, the switch gets stuck. MYC is always on, and it can't turn off. And so we decided we were going to try to make a MYC drug, but it, it proved to be too hard um, uh, um, for the field. And so I thought, well, I'm going to do this at Dana-Farber, because there's a place that values um, real creativity, where uh, we don't regard anything as undruggable, and where people have very low expectations of us in drug discovery. And so that seemed like a perfect place to work. Um, 
One of the other challenges that we have in cancer is that these targeted therapies, when they do work, they don't work long enough for our patients. Here's a gentleman in Florida who had malignant melanoma, a skin cancer all over his body. It was caused by a gene called BRAF. He got a BRAF drug and his tumor melted away in just about eight weeks. Um, unfortunately, um, a couple of weeks later, it came roaring back. You see, cancer is adaptable and cancer is also heterogeneous. And this disease, melanoma, when I was training, um, shown here in this PET scan that lights up where all the cancer is in the bony skeleton um, of this uh, gentleman, um, really underscored for me um, the challenge that we face today. Uh, cancer, we've never known more about it. In the last 10 years, we've generated more knowledge about cancer than in the previous 100. Um, but the medicines are inadequate. We need better medicines. And when I looked at the medicines that were FDA approved, in my time and training as a doctor, they weren't sophisticated chemical substances, arsenic, thalidomide, and this chemical derivative of nitrogen mustard gas called bendamustine. These are good medicines. They keep people alive, um, uh, but they're not the creative substances I imagined when I was training as a medical student. And this was driven home for me in a very personal way when my father was diagnosed eight years ago with pancreatic cancer, and, and he died in four months. And there was not a day of his life after his diagnosis that he, um, that he felt well. Um, it was, a, it was hard, hard to watch. And thinking at that time about the access that I had to all of Harvard's resources in genetics and chemistry and drug discovery, and there was just nothing to do for him. His cancer was caused by a gene called KRAS and a gene called MYC again. And there's no KRAS drug and there's no MYC drug. And so... Um, I decided at the end of my medical training that I really wanted to be part of the solution and that um, it was unacceptable what happened for my father and for many of the patients I've cared for over the years with advanced cancers. And so I went back to school and I retrained in chemistry, the science of making molecules. Um, I was what you call a postdoctoral research fellow. They're normally in their 20s. I was in my late 30s. I was the oldest living postdoc at Harvard Chemistry. I could have been the father of many of the people I worked with. Um, and what I learned was the science of making drugs. And just in case you don't know where drugs come from, we've made this kind of fun graphic I'll show you now. Usually, academia is on one side and pharma is on the other side of something that literally in my field is called the valley of death. I've chosen to make it a, a nice looking um, watering hole. And what usually happens is we publish a paper. We say, you know what, in this particular cancer, the gene that causes it is gene X. And we throw it out there into the medical literature and then we do one of these. We hope that pharma will read this paper and get excited about gene X. And maybe it falls on the shores of a pharmaceutical company, um, Roche or Novartis, it just swims up on the Rhine, and, um, and they become interested. And if they do, this is what happens next. Well, they develop a method to study this gene, and they search for chemicals. Among millions of chemicals, they search for chemicals that might disable that gene. And then when they find something, they will do chemistry around it. They'll take a prototype, and they'll optimize the molecule, adding bits of atomic matter here, subtracting it there, making a better key for the keyhole. After that, they'll use this more mature, what I'll call prototype drug, and they'll put it into cancer cells, and they'll see if, if that molecule does what you would expect an inhibitor of that target to do. So chemistry, biochemistry, cellular biology. And if it looks good, they'll make it a medicine with more chemistry. Chemistry directed at making it orally bioavailable like a tablet or long-lived in your bloodstream so you could take it once a day instead of 18 times a day. Medicinal chemistry. After that, they'll study it in large and small animals and figure out if, if, there's, if it's therapeutically feasible to expose a living and breathing species to your molecule. And they do that in animals before, they do it in humans. Translational research, where this molecule is first studied in humans. It took me about three minutes to take you through that process. In reality, it takes about 10 to 12 years and $800 million. So how many shots on goal does our field get, right? Not enough, not enough. And there's a whole field of people trying to find a way to do it faster and better and with more confidence um, and more collaboratively. 
And so I want to tell you the solution that we've innovated in my lab at the Dana-Farber. I'll tell you about a molecule from my lab called JQ1, um, named for Jun Chi, the chemist who uh, with me invented this molecule. He names all the molecules after himself. He's very <laughs> self-confident in that way. <laughs> Um, I'm going to tell you about the target of this molecule, which is called BRD4. It doesn't stand for Bradner. I dearly wish it did. It stands for bromodomain 4. That's not on the test. And then third, I'm going to tell you about a way that we've been approaching this development of drugs at Dana-Farber, which we call open source drug discovery. Well, there's this MYC again, and we're working very hard to get the MYC inhibitor. But until we do, we're going to try to do what Tony Soprano would do. We're going to go after the godfather, Mick, and then we're going to execute the family. Um, all of the henchmen that Mick works with, its accomplices, will make drugs for them too. And so we invented this JQ1 molecule to target a protein called BRD4, which is shown here spinning around on the left, this little string of amino acids that creates ribbons and pockets. That's a protein. And what this molecule is is a post-it note that's placed around the genome that reminds the cell what kind of cell it is. And during development, it helps the heart remember it's a heart and the brain remember it's a brain. They have the same DNA, the heart and the brain, yet one knows to think and one knows to pump. They have memory. And it turns out cancer cells have memory too. That I told you there could be 100 genes mutated in a cancer, that's the glass half empty. But the glass half full is that means there's 23,900 good ones. And so what we're wondering is, can we make drugs that trick cancer into remembering the good things it can do? Can we trick cancer into forgetting that it's cancer? And so to do this, we made a molecule that lifts post-it notes off the genome. It's called JQ1, and there it is on the left. It's nitrogens and oxygens, sulfur and a chloride, and every other apex, every other um, connecting um, node is a carbon. This is the atomic structure of JQ1. And you can see this red JQ1 on the right fitting just perfectly into its keyhole, as Jun and I engineered it to do. Now what this JQ1 does is it binds the BRD4 po post-it note and just lifts it off the genome. The question is, is that important? And do cancer cells care? Well, this Gleevec molecule on the right works because two chromosomes, chromosome 9 and chromosome 22, normally separated in space, they hook up and they make a cancer-causing gene, a new gene that only exists in the cancer and that is sensitive to that molecule. It turns out that BRD4, our protagonist today, also can hook up with another chromosome. It's 15 and 19 in this case, and it makes a cancer-causing protein. And would you believe that when this happens, this translocation, this new mutation, it's the most aggressive form of lung cancer? It's the most aggressive form of head and neck cancer? There is no cure for this cancer. In fact, there's no therapy that works at all. But we have a molecule that targets this protein, the BRD4 inhibitor, JQ1. And so we put this molecule into Petri dishes. And I want to show you this, if this will work here. And what we found is that in the lower left, there is um, these little dots are all cancer cells. And when we treat them with the molecule, look what happens. They get big and brown. They flatten out. The cancer turns into a human skin you could peel off the bottom of the culture dish. The cancer has totally forgotten that it's cancer. This is around the time in science you get excited about treating some mice because you're thinking maybe this could be a drug. Maybe the mouse will forget it's a mouse. You know, maybe the heart will forget to beat. We need to measure these things. Um, and there was no mouse model of this disease, but I care for these patients who have this rare cancer. And um, there was a fellow whose CAT scan and PET scan you're looking at. Um, there's his brain at the top. You see his bladder at the bottom. And every other dark spot in his body is a cancer. Uh, and it's literally suffocating his um, left lung. And he was at the end of life. Uh, we were reinflating his lung. He's a 29-year-old firefighter from Connecticut just to give him time with his young family and trying to get him home to pass away. Um, and it would be illegal to give him JQ1. It's not a drug at this moment. It had never even been in a mouse. But the loophole is we could do a trial on his cancer with our molecule, even though it's a prototype, just not in him. And so we collaborated with Todd, and we took the material that would every nursing shift um, soak into this chest tube, and we would typically throw it away, but now we would grow it in mice that lack an immune system, 
and treat those mice with our drug. And as you're seeing in the upper hand, right hand corner there, um, in the black line, all the mice that don't get the drug pass away in about seven days, and all the mice that did get the drug, um, well, they, they lived forever. Um, and so this for us was very moving because I'm at that time the only doctor in my lab and, um, and we felt now like we had a real responsibility to get this molecule that we made as a prototype, that we made as a scientific tool, um, it started to feel like a drug. And how would we get this to patients? And so I started talking to the local pharmaceutical companies, the venture capitalists, um, all very helpful and knowledgeable people. And the feedback I got is, this cancer is too rare. No one will ever make money on this. So, um, you know, who's going to pay the $100 million to study this compound if there's like 20 people a year that get it? You know what the number one risk factor of getting this cancer is? Living in Boston. It's not the baked beans. It's that we diagnose it. It's actually mostly unrecognized around the world. It's probably not that rare. So they basically were telling me, find something else that you could do with this molecule that could make more money. Second, uh, this is a prototype. Make the real drug. Make the pill version. Make the injectable version. Finish the chemistry. And third, at Dana-Farber, you don't have the infrastructure needed. You're not a drug company. We're not. You're going to have to team up and bring this forward. And so we did this. To figure out how rare the cancer is, we made a website that says, if you are diagnosed with this cancer, let us know. We'll make a registry. We'll give you our best advice. We'll learn um, if medicines work for you. We'll capture that information, and we'll make it available to the world. Um, the fellow that made the, the, the registry, uh, that programmed it, couldn't make the picture, so we put him in the little <laughs> photograph on the right there. Um, we learned this number one risk factor is living in Boston. There we are with 10 cases in a year. And we um, studied these patients retrospectively, and, and they just they have a horrible prognosis. Um, all comers have a six-month median survival. Anybody with disease in the chest will live less than two months. Uh, this is a desperate situation. And if this cancer is so rare, I can't understand why a, a graduate student from Northeastern University would just walk in off the street uh, with a sore throat and then a lump in his neck and he too was diagnosed with this cancer. And when he came to us at the Farber and I consulted on him, he had our manuscript open, highlighted, and he asked for this JQ1 molecule by name. Um, and it would be illegal to give him that compound, uh, perhaps rightly so. Um, we would need to hurry and make a medicine for these patients. You see, it's not just the drugs that need innovation, it's how we find them that needs innovation. It seems unacceptable to me that we would be 12 years and $800 million away from a medicine for these patients. And so we, we had this advantage. Maybe the one advantage my lab has had over the pharmaceutical industry is that we work at a charity. And so we deeply don't care about the money. We could probably stand to care a little bit more about the money. I drove over here in a Ford Fusion. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and so... Um, so we decided that we were going to experiment with the way drug discovery is done. It's the most famously private industry in the world, more even than defense contracting. And so we thought we were going to do the opposite. We were going to make everything freely available to everybody. And what we did is we did open source drug development. In the software industry, you can have an idea for the Google search term or whatever, the algorithm, and you download all this free code, and then you add your algorithm, and you have Google. That's how most apps are made. Um, but in drug discovery, this is never done. Um, goods that require a lot of professional research, such as the pharmaceutical industry, well, they don't do this. I want to differentiate open source from crowdsource. Crowdsource is, I have a real problem. Can somebody help me with that? Like drugging Mick? Open source is a very non-Harvard thing to say. It's, I have this technology, and I don't know exactly what to do with it. Well, you're welcome to try it. Um, do with it what you will. And, you know, perhaps let us know how it goes. And so we, we synthesized 100 grams of this JQ1 molecule. It cost us about $80,000 to do. And then we just made it freely available to scientists around the world. We even pushed it on a couple of them to get this thing moving. And the big innovation is that um, we kept the lawyers out of the process. And I can say this. I'm married to a lawyer. She's wonderful. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but um, usually, 
when we try to share in science, we have what's called a material transfer agreement. And you say, I'd like to collaborate with you, Anthony. And, and we call our lawyers, and then they meet. And six months later, they say no. Or six months later, they say, guess what? Yes. But six months later, we're not even interested in that question anymore. The grad students graduated. Our science has moved on. We want people to use our technology. And so we created, in the upper right-hand corner, a material transfer agreement that says, don't eat this. Because this isn't a medicine, this is a scientific tool. It's to help the world understand what a medicine of this type could do. It's hard to get an email back from me. I deeply apologize if any of you have emailed me recently. And so um, we made a user's guide. This is how you use it. This is the dose. This is what it should look like. If you want to make it yourself, here's how you do that. We publish the chemical structure. We want people to use it. And then we step back and we just watched what happened and we measured what happened. We learned that this molecule could take leukemia cells on the left and cause them to forget that they're leukemia. They turned into normal cells. We got a call from uh, Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, and they said, um, uh, we got a really cool idea. We'd like to try this in, um, in a form of lung cancer. And we treated uh, patients with lung cancer. Actually, this call came from uh, um, Kwok Wong at Dana-Farber. And look at that, in the lung cancer, this mouse had a complete response. Interestingly enough, the lung cancer I showed you is the rarest form of lung cancer. This is the most common form. And after these two mice, I presented them at the National Meeting of the Cancer Society, the AACR, now everybody wanted to make a drug of this type. How powerful two mice can be. I got a phone call from the HIV community. We'd like to try this drug in HIV. I said, that's a horrible idea. If I understand your field, when you take BRD4 and you lift it up off the genome and you peel away the post-it notes, the HIV is going to turn on. And they said, oh my God, that'd be even better. Well, so why is that? They said, well, our drugs work. The problem is the virus is hiding. It's latent. I said, oh, then you should try it. And they did. And it turns out that here are cells from patients treated in Petri dishes, but they're from patients who have undetectable HIV. And then with this molecule, the HIV becomes detectable again. And now they're waiting for us to figure out the dose and schedule in cancer patients. When Case Western Reserve called, they said, we'd like to try the medicine in heart failure. And I was so mad at myself that I didn't think of this. I was like, ah, oh, that is such a killer use of the molecule. When you develop heart failure on the left side, in this case, we do it surgically in the mouse by ligating the aorta and the heart gets real big and baggy, you can see. All of the pathways like MYC are turned on and this MYC-like inhibitor prevents that from happening. The mouse in the lower right, that's its heart, it's experiencing overwhelming heart failure, but the heart, it has earmuffs on, it can't tell, and it just keeps on beating. And now the cardiovascular community is waiting for us. We put it in mice that were developing atherosclerosis, and they didn't develop atherosclerosis. We put it in mice that were real obese, and they didn't get real obese. We put it in mice that had fatty liver, and they didn't get fatty liver. It starts to sound a little bit like a Ginsu knife commercial. <laughs> There were a lot of things the molecule doesn't do that I wish it did. Um, but we learned all these things, and we learned them in one year by letting our technology out of the shop for others to use. When we made this drug, it hits a protein called BRD4. By accident, an accident of nature, the molecule hits a protein called BRDT as well. I don't study BRDT, so I got on Google. Tell me about BRDT, Dr. Google. And it turns out that the T is for testicles. BRDT is involved in the type of memory required to make sperm. And when you delete BRDT from the mouse genome, male women, uh, female mice are fine. Male mice have no sperm. Um, and, uh, um, but the cool thing about chemical genetics or drugs versus knockout germline genetics is I can put a molecule on and I can take it away. And Potentially, I started wondering, could this be like male contraception, where you treat the male mice and you shut down sperm production, you take the drug away and the sperm comes back, and the pressing need for a, um, well, a male alternative to contraception was driven home for me in a very personal way when my wife gave birth to twins. <laughs> and so we did this. I would be fired if I did this at Dana-Farber. Does anyone know this Santa at the Natick Mall? That guy is unbelievably authentic. Um, <laughs> 
So we took JQ1 and we, I cold called the world's leading spermologist, a reproductive biologist um, at uh, Baylor called Marty Matzik, a lovely man. And we tested it and it fit in the BRDT keyhole just fine. We treated male mice and their testicles got smaller. And before you men start to freak out, let me just tell you that the testicles were smaller because there was no sperm in them anymore. Now, we just had two children at once. The mice get about eight at a time. I can only imagine what that's like at the house. But you can see that the red uh, bar is going down. On the drug, the mice are infertile. And then when you take the drug away, fertility comes right back. And the men in the audience will be relieved to know um, on the leftmost of these graphs, um, you can see that the testicle mass comes back too. Um, believe it or not, this was the invention of non-hormonal male contraception, totally by accident, but made possible through open source drug discovery. It was a fun project for me. It was a real discovery in that field. And I started to wonder, could we've just basically gone from medicine for 12 people a year to a medicine for half the world's fertile population. Could anybody be interested in developing it now? And I went to um, talk to um, pharmaceutical companies and I went to talk to Eli Lilly and you might know they make um, medicines for uh, erectile dysfunction and they know a lot about um, that population and they said well we're just not sure how many people will take this medicine which cracked me up because there are a lot of men out there and you're just talking about those that want control over their reproductive health now i'm not a population biologist but i have an active email account and when this paper was published I started getting interesting emails here's an email from a fella who says um, I know this is real early, but when your research is ready for clinical trials, can I be notified? <laughs> this guy's ready to go. Um, here's somebody that's ready to go right now. I was just married on Saturday, and I'm looking for a second backup to prevent pregnancy. <laughs> Do you offer this to the public? Now, what I love about this guy, this is a real email from my Gmail account. What I love about this guy is, um, number one, have a great night, which is cool. But um, if any of you are married, you know that he's on his honeymoon writing this from my iPhone. So he's sitting there on his honeymoon looking for a male alternative to contraception. Um, you know, I don't know much, but there's, a, this, there's a somebody out there that wants this medicine. Uh, I take a gram a day. I'm just kidding. I don't do that. Um, I signed the MTA. Um, this um, idea of open source drug discovery was picked up by a couple of news outlets. Uh, the Atlantic Monthly thought it was a really uh, cool um, idea, as did this um, online site called Jezebel, um, which may or may not be true, but my lab really enjoyed this. Um, uh, people made a Wikipedia page about JQ1. It was so cool. It's like the molecule has its own website now. Um, people started selling JQ1, which is ridiculous because it's free. Uh, uh, but yet they sell a lot of it. And it turns out some people would rather buy it than get it from me because they worry that I would know that they're interested in the molecule. Aren't people crazy? Uh, and I had a chance to talk about this on the internet. Um, if you've ever been to this website, it's extraordinary. Uh, and this was such a cool experience uh, because uh, it's a way now that we can connect as scientists through this non-publication, non-scientific meeting type of media. And, um, and young people are really into this type of connectivity. It's like the new priority in science is to be connected to other people. And all sorts of people watch this lecture. And in the two or three years since this time, or three or four years since this time, I've been introduced to people all over the world at places that I would normally never go, like Pakistan or New Jersey, and when they get this, uh, when they get this um, idea from watching the talk, they reach out, and we have some manuscripts that have come out of this interaction. In fact, the JQ1 molecule now has been around the world 500 times in labs, really all over the country. We've learned molecules are such powerful tools to understand biology. Around the time we published our molecule, JQ1, GlaxoSmithKline published a molecule that looks just like it. Their molecule is a little bit harder to get. You get it through a lawyer, through a material transfer agreement, the normal way, I'd say. No, no offense to them. They're all good people and know them well. But it allowed us to measure the effect of one drug versus another. And you can see that after around 2010, when the paper comes out, publications in the middle graph double on BRD4. 
And the driver there is the availability of just one of these three really good molecules, the free one, of course. The chemicals availability measurably accelerated our knowledge about biology. I had this little genius uh, in my lab, Angela Fan. She's a computer genius from Harvard University, an undergrad. And when we publish papers, there are multiple names on the byline, co-authorships. And so she measured, what's the effect on the network of people doing science, measured by co-authorships, um, before and after the drug? is made free. And you can see that before, people aren't super collaborative, and there we are right there, not super collaborative. But after the dr drug is published, people start working together. And at the node, connecting all these dots at different institutions, each dot is a different author from a different institution, there's a chemist, um, like JQ, Jun Chi, distributing this molecule. So we knew that there would be an important effect for science, and we were able to see that. But really, this was all about getting the drug to patients. And we got a little tired of just treating mice all the time. And so we finished the chemistry on this molecule. We worked our way around the molecule, tinkering with this piece and that piece, trying to make it just perfect. And eventually, we made a molecule that would last a long time in the blood, could be given in a little insulin shot at home where patients want to be when they're on therapy. Um, and we brought this molecule to patients where it's having quite an extraordinary effect. You know, but the other interesting thing is after we got the word out there, all these other companies started making BRD4 inhibitors. We call them the fast followers. And this is great, actually. I guess it's not great if I'm running a company to have so much competition, but it's great for patients because we want many different drugs to come forward. In fact, I just reviewed the patent literature. There are 79 patents filed from 29 companies since we published JQ1. Um, in a way, it opened the door to a lot of innovation, and hopefully some of these medicines are real breakthroughs. And I can just show you preliminary data, but it's already starting to work in humans. Here's a, a molecule called OTX015. It looks just like JQ1, now owned by Merck Research Labs. And the black line shows the decrease in leukemia in the bone marrow from 100% to 0% over three months time. It's not every patient with leukemia that responded, but we know now these medicines are active in the only relevant model of cancer, humans with cancer. There's a patient with lymphoma and the arrow points to a big shadow in the chest and that mass is starting to go away as well. Um, it's early days, don't call your stockbroker, but we're hopeful that this new type of medicine, a medicine that targets cellular memory, a medicine that targets a collaborator of MYC, could really be very meaningful for many patients. Um, so how are we doing at Dana-Farber? Well, it's early days. Our chemistry program is about 10 years old, but we were asked to justify our existence. I'm sure in your line of work, Dr. Alexander, you never have to do this. There's no board, they wanna see the P&L. Um, uh, so we had to do this, and so we tried to measure what's the impact of this open source on Dana-Farber in the way that they could understand. Our four faculty, myself, Nat Gray, Lauren Walensky, and Sarah Burlage, um, she's brand new, so we didn't put her on the blocks here. Uh, there are three faculty and 58 scientists. We've written a lot of papers, which is what matters in uh, academia, in particular at Harvard. We've made 50 chemical probes like JQ1. There's 49 others. They're not in this talk. I'll put you right to sleep. Um, uh, and we've used this knowledge base to generate a lot of research grants, which is how we keep our shops open at the Farber. Um, but when these molecules leave Dana-Farber, they go out into this rich biomedical research community. And we put them into startup companies that Dana-Farber will own a big piece of um, with the hope that if these medicines work, that maybe someday some of the profits of that science, not run by us at our charity, that it comes back to Dana-Farber and it creates an evergreen source of funding. And it hasn't done that yet, but maybe someday it will. So far, the more than 38 com uh, commercial licenses have created jobs in Massachusetts. They've recruited $300 million of research investment. None of that goes into my lab. It goes into these companies which is a for-profit activity. Um, but perhaps these molecules, when they're definitively developed, they could bring some funding back for our institution. Funding this does not come from private industry. Um, our lab is funded by foundations, uh, by um, some philanthropists, 
and by the federal government. Four branches of the federal government, 10 different granting mechanisms um, fund our science. Um, and it's an amazing lab. Christian's here who works in our lab, an undergraduate from Northeastern. It's all young people just like him. Uh, young scientists who don't have the biases of 20 years of failure in the pharmaceutical industry. They're coming to Harvard to do something extraordinary, something heroic, something creative. And I think that's the secret sauce that has made the whole exercise um, effective. This is our patron saint, JQ himself. Um, if you see him at the Starbucks, shake his hand. He's an amazing guy, and he's led chemistry in my lab for seven or eight years. And you know what's interesting? Um, we've been doing this work, um, a group of about 20 people, in a, a lab at what's called the Longwood Center, the corner of Longwood and Brookline. I welcome you to come by and visit us sometime. And um, in science, is often a, a little bit of a, an isolated experience. It's you and your lab and your computer and your thoughts and your whiteboards. Um, but it's clear now that the, um, that the world is starting to pay attention to this a little bit. Um, I don't know if you know this, but in July, um, I was approached um, to run um, research and development at the, the largest um, pharmaceutical company called Novartis and the Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research. Um, and uh, on January 1st, I'll take the, over the role as president of Novartis Institute. Um, it's an extraordinary group of people that are resourced um, beyond belief uh, to do a measurable good um, for patients with cancer, neurologic diseases, infectious diseases. Our lab at the Farber will soldier on. Our um, program there and its open source philosophy have attracted the interest of the leadership in Novartis. And now they're interested to make um, a pharmaceutical company more accessible to the scientific world. Um, if for me, it's the next chapter in my science, um, uh, but uh, I welcome you to challenge us if there's a way that we can be helpful to you either in my lab or at that organization. And thank you again for the invitation to come talk to you today.